This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We'd like to encourage those of you who are not yet members, and those of you who are not even vegetarian yet, to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. You'll receive an in informative newsletter, as well as discounts on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and the Big Island at many vegetarian and vegan restaurants, businesses and groceries such as at Down to Earth, Organic and Natural stores. You'll also be uh, supporting events such as tonight's which are not only made possible but free to the community as well through your membership dues and donations. VSH members and friends can also enjoy popular social events such as our VSH speakers dine outs. We had one recently on December 17th with Dr. Ruth Heidrich and we had a sold out crowd of 42 attendees enjoying delicious gourmet raw vegan dishes. We'd also like to invite you to stay after tonight's talk to enjoy samples of vegan dishes donated by the generosity of Down to Earth. We're recording tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian, which appears on public access channels across the state including on Oahu's Olelo Channel 55 and Hawaiian Telecom Channel 52. You can also view videos of this and many of our other past presentations on our website www.vsh.org where you'll also find many other resources including our famous dining guide also done by our esteemed Dr. Carl Seff. It is now time for our special guest we're delighted to welcome Dr. John Houck, MD. Dr. John Howard Houck is the 2012 Hawaii Medical Association Physician of the Year. He is a primary care internist, a teacher, and a family man. He began his medical career at the Front Clinic Honolulu in 1980 before going into solo practice in 1988. Throughout his career, he has been passionate about establishing primary care as the foundation of our health care system. He worked to accomplish this goal with several multi-year projects, including the promoting of the resource-based relative value system in association with the American Society of Internal Medicine in the 1980s, founding the Hawaii Independent Practice Association in the 1990s, and most recently as a physician leader of the patient-centered medical home movement in Hawaii. Dr. Houck is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Hawaii's John A. Burns School of Medicine, where he lectures to medical students and mentors third-year students for their outpatient medicine rotation. He has been a facilitator of a progressive Christian adult education program at Central Union Church. He is a frequent lecturer both to physician groups as well as to general audiences. He is also a Chicago boy who met his wife, Jane Chalk, while they attended Beloit College in Wisconsin. They live in Kailua, have two grown daughters, and together enjoy entertaining and travel. John has hosted an annual birthday celebration for Abraham Lincoln, and for the occasion, he personally cooks up a selection of period cuisine for his guests. He is a recovered golf and genealogy addict who discovered he had a backyard hmm, a few years ago, and now actively gardens. Dr. Houck's presentation tonight is entitled, Plant-Based Whole Foods, A Doctor's Journey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Houck. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I am honored to be here tonight. Dr. Heydrich uh, invited me 
to give this speech back in early November, and I initially said no. I don't know if you've worked with Dr. Heydrich before, but she doesn't take no easily, and she continued to use her persuasive techniques, and voila, here I am tonight with you. This is an outline of what I'll be talking about tonight, describing a journey, my own journey to a plant-based diet. I'll talk to you and share with you some stories from my, my own medical practice, and then end with trying to answer that question, why isn't everyone a vegan? Why did I convert to a plant-based whole food uh, diet in 2012? Well three reasons, and I'll go through them tonight. The first reason is I was ready, and there had been a lot of preparation before I made that decision. The second was that I found that the scientific evidence was building over the years, but I found it more and more compelling when I looked at it most recently. And lastly, and probably the most important reason, was I needed to do it to be an ex example to my patients. So. Mary Ann Overstreet gets credit for me being here tonight. I will explain. So Mary Ann is one of my patients and has been so for many years. She is one of my healthier patients. She comes to see me oh, about once a year. On April 23rd, 2012, she was in my office and we were talking about osteoporosis. And I said, Mary Ann, I think you need to increase your calcium intake more specifically you need to get that calcium from your food, and I would suggest that you have more milk and more cheese and yogurt in your diet. <laughs> and, and Mary was very nice, and she uh, said, uh, Dr. Houck, uh, have you ever heard of the China study? And I said, no, I'd never heard of the China study. And, and she didn't protest too much that afternoon, but she said, you know, I'll send you something in the mail. And about two or three weeks later, I got an envelope, and in that was the DVD, Forks Over Knives. And I get a lot of stuff from my patients. I try to read through it. Some of it's a little bit out there in right field. But for some reason, I opened the DVD and invited Jane, my wife, to sit down and watch it with me. And we did, and something clicked. I distinctly remember a couple of weeks later, I was out for my birthday dinner, June 8th of 2012, and I ordered all vegan items off the menu. My family was somewhat surprised, but I, I, I remember that was a, a turning point in my journey. But you know, before I made that decision in 2012, I had a lot of other opportunities to adopt a vegan diet. It started back in medical school. I was actually a freshman in medical school. There was a fellow by the name of Nathan Pritikin. Published a bestseller, New York Times. It was on the bestseller list for 52 weeks. He himself had coronary artery disease in his 40s. He did research. He was not a physician. He was an engineer. He was not trained in nutrition. But he self-taught, he was really a, quite a brilliant guy, self-taught himself and discovered that a low-fat diet high in unrefined carbohydrates was the treatment of choice for coronary artery disease. He applied it to himself, had a dramatic turnabout in his, his own health, and began to invite people to seminars. And so my father, born in 1912, raised on a small farm in Indiana. This is with my daughter, who is, I think, 30, 31 years old now. He married my mother, 1939, and we had a typical Midwestern dinner of pork chops and mashed potatoes, gravy, milk, and canned corn. I remember he read a book by Adele Davis in 1950. She, I think she was one of the earlier advocates for a high-protein diet. And when I would have lunch with him downtown in the Chicago Loop, I remember him almost every day. He would have a hamburger patty and a scoop of cottage cheese. And at age 62, he had his first heart attack. By 64 in 1976, he had his bypass graft, which uh, did not improve his situation. And he was pretty much a cardiac cripple. He could not walk uh, half a block without incapacitating chest pain. 
And I was a freshman medical student at the time, and he called me up and he said, you know, John, there's this guy named Nathan Pritikin. He's got a program out in Santa Monica where you come out and for two weeks he'll teach you a plant-based diet and help you with exercise. I said, Dad, you've tried everything that 1970s medicine can offer you and you are not doing well. I have no objections if you go out there and see Nathan Pritikin. Well, he did. He converted and he was a vegan the last 12 years of his life. He did eventually succumb to heart disease at age 80 but you know, lived an additional 15 years uh, following the Pritikin diet. But you know, despite the fact that Pritikin saved my father, I personally did not become a vegan. Um, I was too busy in life at that time. I was a freshman medical student and I was just trying to get by. But I had a second chance. And Dr. Dennis Burkett actually became famous in Africa for a, a lymphoma named after him called Burkitt's lymphoma that we all learned about as medical students. But late in life, he began to tour the country and talk about what he had found from his practice in Africa. In Africa, treating people who live largely off the land on vegetables they grow, I hardly ever saw cases of many of the most common diseases in the United States and England including coronary artery disease, adult onset diabetes, varicose veins, obesity, diverticulitis, appendicitis, gallstones, dental cavities, hemorrhoids, hiatus hernia, and constipation. So this is John Houck, the medical student a few years ago, and uh, Dr. Burkett came to University of Illinois. And I was a third year medical student at this point, and he lectured. And he basically talked about that he thought that fiber was the important thing that needed to be added to the diet. And during his lecture, he invited any medical student who was in the audience to do research with him, and he had a project for a medical student. And I actually personally sat down and spent an hour with Dennis Burkett in about 1975. He offered to do a research with me, and John Houck turned him down. So I don't know how many medical students can say that they turned Dennis Burkett down, but he's one of the giants of medicine. I can't tell you in retrospect why. I know I was busy, and I was thinking about my exams, getting through medical school, and I did not adopt a plant-based diet at that time. In 1980, I had finished my training. I had married my college sweetheart, Jane, who was uh, born and raised in Hawaii. We came, and my parents, this is my father again, came to visit me in 1980. I was practicing originally in IAEA and then in Honolulu, and there was a fellow by the name of John McDougall. And John McDougall was practicing in Kailua at that time. He would talk about his experience when he was working on the Big Island, observing that his elderly patients from the Far East, the first generation Asian immigrants, who lived mainly on rice and vegetables, even when they moved to the Big Island, they were still eating pretty much the diet that they had had uh, back in the old country. That these elderly patients were trim and healthy compared to their offspring, their children and their grandchildren, who had been tempted by the American diet. And he noticed that the offspring developed degenerative diseases that the first generation did not have. And he published his concepts, his ideas, into the McDougall Plan, 1983. I was well aware of this back at that time. This is what uh, Dr. McDougall said about Dennis Burkett. On a cold Michigan winter day in 1971, Dr. Dennis Burkett changed my life and my medical career. During a noontime doctor's conference, he provided convincing evidence that the rich Western diet was the underlying cause of almost all of the chronic diseases I was learning about during medical school training. So Burkett convinced McDougall, but didn't convince Hauk, and so now I had my third chance to become convinced by Dennis Burkett. As I mentioned to you, I had not adopted a vegan diet, and even Dr. McDougall's uh, influence to me did not convince me because I was busy. At this point, I was busy raising a family and trying to set up my practice. I had other chances. I remember reading Terry Shintani's first book, The Hawaii Diet. And then came along the Okinawan Diet, which is basically a plant-based diet. And I also read Dean Ornish's earlier work, one of them I've listed here, Eat More and Weigh Less. And so despite really knowing 
full well many of the benefits of a plant-based diet. I didn't follow it because I was busy. <laughs> At this point, moving my practice from Aiea down into Honolulu. I can't tell you what it was about forks over knives and what it was about the straw that broke the camel's back. Because following watching this video, I was ready. And Jane and I watched it in May of 2012. I began my own uh, plant-based diet. And I began a, a self-study, initially looking at Colin Campbell's China study, and then read Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Dr. Esselstyn, and The Starch Solution by John McDougall. I began to talk to my patients about plant-based diet, and one of them said, Ah, oh, you're talking about the Bill Clinton diet. <laughs> the former patient, known for his love of burgers, barbecue, and junk food, has gone from a meat lover to a vegan, the strictest form of a vegetarian diet. He says he eats fruits, vegetables, and beans, but no red meat, chicken, and dairy. Rumor has it he's slid back a little bit lately, but I think he is primarily a vegan. So what is a vegan? I began to, to learn from my patients. You know, the dictionary we all refer to now is Wikipedia. So from Wikipedia, dietary vegans or strict vegetarians refrain from consuming animal products. Not only meat, in contrast to ovo-lacto-vegetarians, but also eggs, dairy products, and other animal-derived substances. We talked to patients about this, they would say, you know, I'm a vegan, but not because it's healthy for me. I'm a vegan because I am trying to sustain our planet. So, an environmental vegan, this veganism refers to the avoidance of animal products on the premise that the harvesting or industrial farming of animals is environmentally damaging and unsustainable. And one of my patients encouraged me to watch this YouTube video by Arian Tavakoli. And I would encourage you, I think it's an excellent introduction to uh, sustainability through changing your diet. Al Gore is a vegan now. Forbes reported in this week's issue of the Washington Post confirmed a source close to Gore on Monday. He had gone vegan. I guess he had been criticized for his sustainability issue and he was a I think a beef farmer or something like that. And then, so he has now gone vegan. Other patients talked to me about that they were a vegan again, not for health reasons, but for ethical reasons. And the term ethical vegan is often applied to those who not only follow a vegan diet, but extend the vegan philosophy into other areas of their lives and oppose the use of animals or animal products for any purpose. And one of my patients encouraged me to watch one of the YouTube vi videos by Gary Urofsky. He is a, a zealot. If you want to have an interesting one-hour lecture from Gary Urofsky, I would encourage you to, to watch one of his uh, YouTube videos. So the second major reason I changed my diet was that I found that the scientific evidence was overwhelming. I mentioned Colin Campbell. He's one of the researchers featured on the Forks Over Knives video. He conducted what they now refer to as a China Cornell Oxford project. It was a large study conducted throughout the 1980s in rural China. This study examined the diets, lifestyle, and disease characteristics of people living in 65 rural Chinese counties. What they basically did is looked at, in a county, what they ate, what diseases they developed, and what they died from. What he was able to f find, he and the other uh, Chinese involved in this research, was that the diseases of affluence, diabetes, strokes, heart attacks, cancer of the colon, cancer of the breast, and cancer of the prostate tissue was associated with the consumption of animal protein and dairy products. The rural counties in China didn't have those diseases of affluence. And as the counties, those that had more animal products had more of those diseases of affluence. 
I think Colin Campbell has been at this podium uh, previously. I am honored to be at the same podium that Colin Campbell was at. Dr. Esselstyn is another researcher also featured on Forks Over Knives. He talks about in his book, The Reversal of Atherosclerosis by following a no oil, whole foods, plant-based diet. And in some cases, he combines that diet with cholesterol lowering medication. He was a surgeon at Cleveland Clinic. Specialty was breast cancer. He said he tired of removing breast and wanted to figure out some way to prevent breast cancer. He did research and he found that plant-based diet was the best prevention for breast cancer. But he also found that it was very important for prevention of heart disease. He was working at the Cleveland Clinic, one of the major heart centers in the United States, and he was able to convince some of his cardiology colleagues to send him patients who had heart disease for treatment with a low-fat, plant-based diet. He collected about 20 patients, and these were mostly end-stage heart disease patients. These would be similar to my father, who had had bypasses and, or failed these are also patients that did not want to take medications or have stents or bypasses, but they were pretty much cardiac cripples. And he would teach them a no oil, whole food approach. He had a very hands-on, very intensive treatment program. And I think the study has been going on now for 15 years, and out of, I think, the original 22, I think 15 are still living. He attributes this to this no oil, whole foods diet. And again, he is featured on that Porks Over Knives video. There are other, what I consider the pioneers in plant-based diet. Dean Ornish was one of the first to show that you could reverse atherosclerosis with a plant-based diet. He did that by doing an angiogram, had a patient who had an angiogram and had basically very narrow coronary arteries as a basis of and then what he did was he, he took that patient with the narrow coronary arteries, put them on a plant-based, no oil diet, and went back six months to a year later and did the angiogram again. And what he was able to show was that there was actually reversal. And then prior to his work and some other similar work, people had always said that atherosclerosis was irreversible. Once you had plaque, it was permanent. He was actually able to show with, with diet that you could actually re reverse atherosclerosis. Neil Barnard, who has written several books, published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the more prestigious journals that we give a lot of credit to. He compared uh, two groups. He had one, uh, they were all diabetics. One half of them were given a typical American Diabetes Association diet. The other one given a plant-based whole food diet. And he was able to demonstrate that those on the plant-based whole food diet actually did better than the one on the American Diabetes Association diet. That their A1Cs dropped uh, better and their blood sugars were better and they required less medications than those on the, the American Diabetes Association diet. Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians. There has been the longest running Seventh-day Adventist trials out of Loma Linda in the literature. And what they have shown is that Seventh-day Adventists in California live longer than non-Seventh-day Adventists living in neighboring communities, and that they have less of the degenerative diseases that I mentioned before, less heart disease and less cancer. Michael Greger is not a primary researcher himself, but he is a tireless collector and presenter of plant-based diet research. His website, nutritionfacts.org, is just an excellent website. If you want more information based on good medical research, I cannot overemphasize to you the value of going to nutritionfacts.org. I want to know that, you know, I come home for dinner at night, my wife will tell me the latest Dr. Greger that has come up. Every day he's got a new video. And so I learned from it, but laypersons can learn from Dr. Gregory. He does it in a very interesting, humorous, a little bit bizarre fashion, but it's a, it's a very good educational tool. 
This is what Dr. Greger said about Nathan Pritikin. Remember Nathan Pritikin, who I talked about earlier? So Nathan Pritikin reversed his own heart disease with a plant-based diet and went on to help millions of others. He even saved the life of my own grandmother, which is what inspired me to go into medicine. The third reason I became a vegan was that I needed to be an example. Now, in my practice, I have 1,700 patients, and most of them are healthy. Marianne Overstreet is a good example of the healthy patients I have in my practice, and many of them I don't have to do a lot for. I just see them and, and, and give them a checkup. But many of my patients are overweight. In fact, I looked at my practice recently, and I calculated the average body mass index in my practice, and it's 26. So desirable body mass index, that's a measurement of weight is 25 or less. Some people would say it should be less than 25. But in any case, my practice, the average patient is overweight. And I have 120 patients in my practice who have diabetes. And I have 240 with high blood pressure and about the same number with high cholesterol. I've been in practice for 30 years. And I worked hard to try to help my patients lose weight, control their diabetes without medications, control their blood pressure without medications and cholesterol, but I was not very successful in that for 30 years until I began to talk to them about a plant-based diet. Now, after I watched the DVD, you know how you become a zealot when you first take on and become a, a vegan, and so I was a zealot there, and so, but I was, a, you know, a gentle zealot, I guess I'd say. And, and the first visit, I'd do a standard office visit with my patients, and at the very last minute or so, I would turn to them and say, I have homework for you. And I'd pull out my little doctor pad, and I'd write at the top of it, I want you to watch Forks Over Knives. And I want you to watch that with your significant other, your, your wife, and your, your, your teenage children or older if they're living at home with you. I wouldn't let them off the hook, and when they came back for their second visit, I'd say, did you watch Forks Over Knives? And I would estimate that about half of my patients actually did my homework and watched Forks Over Knives. Some of them started it and didn't finish it, but <laughs> the majority of them actually watched Forks Over Knives. And that would prompt a discussion, and either in that second or the third visit, I would do a little, and I developed this little five-minute soliloquy in which, in which I talk about a plant-based diet. And what I'm going to do over the next couple minutes is actually pretend that you're the patient, Mr. Jones, and I'm going to go through my little five-minute soliloquy. This is a copy of my hand, or is that actually a typed copy of what I write out, handwritten, and hand to each patient when they leave. Now, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, I want you to eat a plant-based whole food diet. Now, this is the diet that I follow, and I recommend it for you. What I want you to do is I want you to eat these. I want you to eat potatoes and whole grains and vegetables and beans and fruit and nuts. Now, I apologize to all my patients out there that have heard this once or twice already, but a little review won't hurt you. So these are the items that I want you to eat. Now, why are you here? You are here so you won't have a heart attack, so that you can decrease your risk of a stroke, diabetes. You don't want to have cancer of the colon, cancer of the breast, cancer of the prostate. You don't want Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm telling you is I don't want you to eat these items because they will increase your risk of these diseases. I want you to avoid beef. And I want you to avoid pork. And at this point, Mr. Jones comes in and says, yeah, I, I don't eat much red meat, uh, Dr. Houck. But I also want you to avoid chicken. Chicken? I thought chicken was good for you. Uh, and I also want you to avoid fish. Fish? I'm, everybody, my last doctor told me to eat fish all the time. In fact, you used to tell me that, Dr. Houck. <laughs> I want you to avoid dairy. I want you to avoid eggs. Eggs, I thought they said an egg a day is okay for you. And cheese, 
ah, oh, doc, I can't give up cheese and processed food because it's high in salt and sugar and fat. Now, Mr. Jones, I can't really tell you exactly why this is true. If you watch the video Forks Over Knives, Colin Campbell will tell you that it is the protein, the animal-based protein that causes cancer. Dr. Esselstyn will tell you that it's a saturated fat and the oils in these foods that cause heart attacks and strokes. Other researchers will tell you that it's the phytonutrients and the vitamins in the plant-based foods that will decrease your risk of these degenerative diseases. I think it's all of the above, and I can't tell you exactly what it is. And it's not so much that the chicken you eat tonight is going to kill you, but if you fill up on these foods over here, you're less likely to eat these foods over here. So the more you avoid these foods, the more you're going to eat the good foods for you. Now, when you go home, you'll remember some of what I said, but I want you to go back and watch that movie, Forks Over Knives, again. But I also would encourage you to go to two different websites to learn more. DrMcDougall.com particularly is good because he's got a thousand different recipes for free that you can go to and learn how to cook these foods. And then you can also go to Gregor's website, nutritionfacts.org, and you can learn more about what I've just taught, taught you. Now, this is just on a little doctor's notepad. I'd tear it off and give it to them. And patients have told me that they put it on their refrigerator. <laughs> One of them has actually framed it and put it on the wall. But this little piece of paper has been very uh, powerful within my practice, most powerful thing that I've done in my practice in 30 years in terms of changing behavior. This is Dr. Houck's honor roll, I call it. There's 24 patients on this honor roll. And what I've listed, and I know you can't read all these, but the weight that they started with and their current weight, it says is how much weight loss that they have achieved. The biggest loser, 48 pounds. And anybody over 10 pounds in my practice is listed on this. Actually, there's more than 24, but these are 24 that I've selected. Now, another way to look at this 24 patients is on the left side is what their weight was at the baseline when I first started to talk to them about a plant-based diet. And you can see that the average weight in this group was about 225 pounds. And when they last came to see me, they were down under 200 pounds, and so the average weight loss was about 25 pounds in this group. Now remember, I just started talking to them about this 18 months ago. So we're talking 25 pound weight loss in the last 18 months among these 24 patients. A Couple of stories, one of those patients, in fact the biggest loser, 56 year old male, he is a practicing lawyer, in March of 2013, he weighed 303 pounds. He had never been over 300 pounds. It was a wake-up call. And he had tried many different things to lose weight. But that day I was talking to him about my little plant-based whole food approach. And he started it and came back. For his last visit to, in November, he was down to 255 pounds. Now, he basically ate plant-based foods six days a week. And on the seventh, he eats whatever he wants. And I said, you know, keep doing it. <laughs> I don't want to change you to a seven-day guy, seven guy because you're doing just great with six days. Interestingly, his wife had not converted. So this fellow was going home, and the wife was chowing down on steaks, and he was eating plant-based foods those six days. So I give him a lot of credit. It has not only been successful in my practice to help patients lose weight, but it's also been effective to help them reduce their medications. Another fellow, 55-year-old, works in the information technology area. He had diabetes and was on medication. He had high cholesterol and was on medication. And he also had blood pressure and was on medication. In January of 2013, he weighed 162 pounds. His body mass index was 26, not that heavy. But he wanted to get off of medications, and that was his primary motivation. 
He began a, a plant-based diet. And when he returned, when I last saw him in September, he was down to 135 pounds, almost 30 pound weight loss. His body mass index had dropped from about 26 down to 22. And he was off of all of his medications, which was what he wanted to do. He still had diabetes, but it was diet controlled. His cholesterol was down, not perfect, but down. And he was, had normal blood pressure off of all medications. And he was a very happy gentleman. It doesn't work for everybody. There, I have frustrated vegans in my practice. I'm sure there are some frustrated vegans out there tonight, too. This is a 52-year-old female, home-based employment. I talked to her about a plant-based diet. And in January of 2013, she came in at 158 pounds. And when she came back three months later, she was 159 pounds. Her cholesterol had gone from 234 up to 255. And her triglycerides had been unchanged. And when I talked to her and she described the diet, she had indeed given up animal-based products. But she had replaced them and had actually increased her consumption of a lot of processed foods. So I think that it was not a plant-based whole food diet. It was a vegan diet, but I would not say it was a healthy diet, one that would promote weight loss. I've asked myself since I began this journey, you know, what are my goals now as a physician? Am I trying to convert all of my patients to become a vegan? Or should I just try to push plant-based foods to my sick patients? Maybe that's where I should concentrate. Should I be happy if I just increase the consumption of plant-based foods in my patients? Or would I be happy if I decrease their animal product consumption? Another thing that I have learned is that I have to bring up this subject to the appropriate patient. One of the things that they teach us is motivational interviewing. If you have a patient who's going through a divorce, they have a death in the family, and they need other counseling during that session, I'm not discussing plant-based whole foods. You have to find somebody who is motivated, wants to make that change, and those are the ones that I've concentrated on. I want to talk to you a little bit about evaluation of research. First type of research that is presented to you is anecdotal research. These are stories about single patients. And I have presented to you anecdotal research tonight, examples from my practice. These can be very powerful examples, and they can be very motivating. But you should not use anecdotal stories as a basis for changing your life. You need better research than just, I did this in one patient, and they did well. Therefore, it should be good for all of you. You need more than one patient stories to make a powerful argument. So there are epidemiological studies. The China study by Colin Campbell is an example of an epidemiological study. Large populations are studied, and we look at the effects of, it, of, of what their diet is on their disease prevalence and their death rates. There are other studies that would be done in the laboratory. These do not involve live patients. These are studies that are done in what we call in vitro, either in a petri dish or in a test tube. An example would be take some prostate cancer cells, grow them on a petri dish, and then expose them to various substances. And some of the things that they've done is compare different juices. Cranberry juice decreases rate of growth of prostate cancer cells. They've also compared vegan blood with non-vegan blood, in other words, people who consume animal products, and pour that blood or that serum on prostate cancer cells, and have been able to show that you know, vegan blood slows cancer growth in prostate more so than non-vegan blood. That's an example of laboratory studies, in vitro studies. That doesn't necessarily translate that, that if you drink cranberry juice, you're going to have less prostate cancer. I mean, it suggests that, but it does not prove that. So what you really need for that are what we call clinical studies, where you take live patients and there are various types of clinical research. There's one in which you just simply have a, a population, and it can be in your practice, and you describe an intervention in this group of patients. Probably one of the more famous ones for plant-based research is the one by Dr. Swank. 
and he has spent his career working with patients with multiple sclerosis on a plant-based diet, and he basically describes how well these patients have done on a plant-based diet. He does not have a control group in his papers, but it's very compelling when you read through his research. There are other clinical studies where you have a control group, and I described to you Dr. Barnard's study earlier, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You have a group of diabetics, you give half of them a vegan diet and half of them the American Diabetes Association, and you look at their outcomes. That's a more powerful study and one that a physician is more likely to follow than some of the other studies. But why aren't more doctors vegans? It's a good question. If the evidence is so compelling for me, why isn't all so compelling for all doctors? The basis of modern medical practice today is based on large, multi-centered, placebo-controlled, double-blind studies published in peer-reviewed journals and repeated by a second or third team of researchers. What does that mean? Multi-centered, a lot of different hospitals. You get thousands of patients in these studies. You take half the group and you do an intervention, you give them a drug, and the other half the group, you give them a placebo. Neither the doctors nor the patients know who's getting the real thing and who's getting the placebo. You then publish that in a reputable journal, one that has peers checking your research and making sure it was done well. And then you have other people repeat that same research and publish it also in peer-reviewed journals. And then even better than that, you do a meta-analysis where you take all of this data from various studies and combine it into a single study. And those are the studies that doctors like to use as the basis for what they recommend to you. Unfortunately, there are very few studies that demonstrate the benefits of plant-based diet with these very rigid criteria. Now, part of it is, how do you do a placebo-controlled trial with a plant-based diet? You can't do it. So it's a difficult study to do, probably never gonna be done. The other reason why doctors do not, I think that doctors don't follow a vegan diet is for this tomato effect. In Europe, they ate tomatoes and loved them. In America, they thought tomatoes were poisonous. The entire European community was eating tomatoes for hundreds of years, and Americans wouldn't eat it. Until somebody, I think, stood on the uh, steps of the Philadelphia courthouse and ate a tomato and survived. And Americans began to eat tomatoes, but it took years to convert them. And so doctors are like patients or, or, or other people. If everybody else isn't a vegan, it's unusual for doctors to convert themselves to vegan. And you don't necessarily want to be the, the oddball out there. Marathon runners are like vegans. If you've met one vegan, you have met one vegan. I have never met two vegans who are alike in what and how they eat. Even husbands and wives who are both vegans eat differently. There are some vegans who eat a very simple kind of vegan diet and others very complex. They have to have certain foods with other certain foods in the morning and a different variation at lunch. Simple versus complex. There are those that juice and those that blend. There are those who eat nothing but raw and those that cook it. I even met people who eat cooked meals, but they don't cook themselves. I don't know how you do that, but you, you, I guess you buy your cooked food outside. And then there are vegans who are not strict. There's a book called VB6, Vegan Before Six, a New York food critic. He couldn't be a food critic and, and, and be a vegan at nighttime. So he's a vegan for breakfast and lunch, but not for dinner. So I have a new one, VF6. That's my patient who has vegan for six days, and then on the seventh day, eats whatever he wants. So VF6 is the new kind of vegan. There are some medical issues for vegans, and I mentioned this to you earlier. Vegan is not the same as plant-based whole foods. Caution, Coke and potato chips are vegan, but they're not healthy. There is, of course, the issue of B12. If you are a strict vegan, you need to take a B12 supplements. A B12 supplement, I did not find any authority that disagreed with that one. On the issue of osteoporosis, calcium and vitamin D, experts suggest that vegans should take calcium and vitamin D. 
There's absolutely no agreement on how much calcium you should take and how you should take it. And there is also no agreement on the vitamin D. And if I was to come up with a recommendation for you tonight, I would guarantee it would be different five years from now. So I'm, I'm sorry, there's lots of controversy in this area. Omega-3s. This is a quote from Jack Norris, a registered dietitian. He also has a website. Without diet planning, vegans and vegetarians have low omega-3 intakes and blood levels. It is not clear whether these lower blood levels are harmful, although it's been suggested. And it is not likely to be well understood any time too. But most authorities would say that since vegans are low in the omega-3s, you should take some type of a supplement to increase your omega-3. What type of supplement? Very controversial. Didn't get two people to agree on exactly how to increase your omega-3s. So, options for vegans. There's the basic vegan diet. And I like this one. Uh, this is my, I, I'm a simple kind of guy. This is uh, Colin Campbell's recommendation. You know, eat a variety of plant-based foods. Go to the farmer's market. Get whatever's on sale this week. <coughs> and get as big a variety as you can within those categories. Eat a different potato. Eat some white ones, eat some purple ones, and eat some red ones. Get different type of broccolis and cauliflower and leafy greens and try the biggest variety you can because you're more likely to get those phytonutrients and those vitamins when you get a variety. If you're doing a strict basic vegan diet, you need B12. Most of them would agree that 100 to 250 micrograms of B12 a day is probably sufficient. Now, another type of a vegan is one that I call a vegan for optimal health. They're going to spend more time trying to do a more perfect vegan diet. What's the best potato? You know, a purple potato is probably better than a red potato and is probably better than a white potato. So they're going to eat more purple potatoes. And there's a perfect berry. So they will try to optimally improve their health. I think most people who have diseases, particularly, you know, heart disease or cancer, are more likely to follow this optimal health type of diet than those who are healthy and just want to stay healthy. People who are pursuing an optimal health diet will supplement with B12, calcium, vitamin D, DHA, ALA, vitamin A, lysine, and many other recommendations out there. And then there's the last group, and I call them the almost vegan diet. And this is my patient who does it six days a week, and other people would call them flexitarians. Uh, they are vegans for most, most, but they will vary off of that. More information, these are some of the websites that I have mentioned earlier in the talk. Nutritionfacts.org is Gregor's website. I think it's great. Dr. McDougall's website, Forks Over Knives has their own website. Nutritionstudies.org, I believe, is Dr. Furman's website, and Pritikin has his own website. That's a picture of the sky at my daughter's wedding on Lanai back in June. It was an, a gorgeous night. So I started with thanking Marianne Overstreet, but uh, I have to thank my wife, Jane. I wouldn't be here tonight without Jane. She is uh, Okinawan Chinese and is a wonderful cook. And she has taken many of her previous recipes and has tweaked them into vegan preparations. You know, on the left is a vegetarian sukiyaki, and on the right is a vegetarian bibimbap. She said, you know, you got white rice in that bibimbap. It's not really a whole food, but I, I show you this, the, the slide anyway tonight. But anyway, thanks to my wife. You know, with that, I will conclude, and thank you very much for the your attendance tonight, and I will open it up for some questions. Thank you. Do I consider tofu a processed food? It is a lightly processed food. <laughs> you know, I think anybody, most folks who are vegan eat some processed food. And the point is, is to, uh, Avoid it. You know, a bean is probably better for you than tofu, 
but I eat tofu, and I think most vegans are eating tofu, and I think, so it's processed, but it's a lightly processed food. So the question was, do vegans have less energy than non-vegans, or do some vegans have less energy than non-vegans? And how about the protein issue? I would say that most of my patients who have come in with and, and converted to a plant-based diet say they feel better and have more energy than they had before. Not all of them, but I would say the vast majority of them would say they are better. And most authorities, and I, I don't stand up here as a, an authority, as a researcher uh, who's done exhaustive research in this, but most of the people, and, and I, I, I attribute this to John McDougall, would say that plant-based whole foods have got all the protein that you need. And particularly if you're going with some beans in your diet, but even potatoes have enough protein that you will not become protein deficient if you're eating a plant-based diet. So there's enough protein in there, and if you're worried about that, eat a few more beans. So his question is about epigenetics, and you know, if you asked me that a year ago, I would have said, what is epigenetics? And so it is the hot thing right now, and we're you know, it used to be thought that your DNA is your DNA, and you can screw it up, you know, with radiation, but epigenetics is this thing where what's going on in your environment actually changes your DNA. And yes, they are doing some neat research with plant-based diets and showing that good things are happening with your genes with, with plant-based diet. I can't go too much more in that, but yes, even with epigenetic, they're finding some good research. Way in the back. So the question is, he has heard that the estrogen content of tofu may be harmful to men. You know, I think the debate on tofu is going to go on in your lifetime and my lifetime. I can remember a report that came out about 20 years ago, actually the Honolulu Heart Study, that tofu was associated with Alzheimer's disease. And if you ate tofu, you had more Alzheimer's disease. Well, you know, other people tried to repeat that study and they were never able to show that same demonstration. But I am not aware that you're going to get into problems eating modest amounts of tofu. I think that's the best I can give you, but I'm not an expert in this area. The, the hand that's waving, yes. So, you know, I knew the question about GMO was going to come up tonight. <laughs> and I didn't mention it at all. You know, and I think that, you know, from my perspective as a physician, the most important thing you can do is eat foods from that left column and avoid the foods from the right column. Okay? Remember the left column and the right column? So if you can get organic, non-GMO, plant-based foods, I think that's ideal. But if you cannot, I think it is more important that you just stay on that left column, you know, whether it's GMO or whether it's non-organic, I think as long as you stay on that left column, you're going to receive most of the health benefits. Now, I know we can have debates tonight on this one. I, I feel the most important thing is plant-based whole foods. If you can get it organic and non-GMO, more better. Lots of questions, yes. My understanding is that the American Pediatrics Council has uh, approved a plant-based diet as appropriate for, for, for kids. Now, I'm not a pediatrician, so I don't want to stand up here and give advice for kids, but my understanding is that yes, a plant-based diet is very appropriate for children as well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can tell you, except that's what Esselstyn, he, th he thinks that any kind of oil is not good for you, because it's fat. And he thinks that oil is uh, more atherosclerotic. It's a processed food. And I think that's the whole, whole basis, is that uh, it's a processed food. Coconut oil is vegetable oil. Again, it's a processed food, but it happens to be one of the few vegetable oils that's just loaded with saturated fat. And most of the authorities that I hear would say that it's saturated fat is saturated fat, and it is not good for you. So I'm not up here to promote coconut oil. In terms of Alzheimer's disease and coconut oil, uh, there's very little evidence to support that as well, and it's been looked at. I would discourage people from taking coconut oil to prevent Alzheimer's disease or to treat Alzheimer's disease. So personal experience. You know, I said I wasn't ready for a lot of, during those 30 years I listened to these folks, but I did 
make changes. And so, you know, my breakfast for the last 30 years has been shredded wheat and a banana, okay? Now I have shredded wheat, flaxseed, strawberries, blueberries, banana, and uh, either soy milk or almond milk or rice milk. That's how I've converted. But I already had a pretty good diet. I weighed 158 pounds. I now weigh about 150 pounds. Felt good before, felt good now. You know, it's interesting, the biggest difference, <laughs> you'll laugh at this one, bad breath. I used to go through and have, you know, this sucrets on my desk and I'd go through one a week. And that disappeared. You know, McDougall says it's the thionine or the sulfur containing products in the meat that gives you the bad breath. So that was the most gratifying for me is that, you know, I used to have patients that were kind of doing this with me and, and I was popping mints and, and they don't do that anymore. So you know, I'm sure I don't have perfect breath, but it's certainly better than it was in years past. You know, bowel movements obviously improve. I wasn't constipated before, but I certainly am not constipated now. <laughs> You know, it's not perfect. I had a kidney stone. I had kidney stones before, and I passed a kidney stone about a month ago. I've been told that veganism is pretty good for kidney stones, but I have some pretty strong genes that give me kidney stone. I'm hopeful that's my last kidney stone, though. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, you know. Raw, so, raw food, vegan. Yeah. So Dr. Heydrich spoke here last month, and she is a raw vegan, and I think that's just fine. I think I have no problems with that. I think that's a very healthy approach and she's a very good example of that. I kind of like my food cooked, but I eat a fair amount of raw food as well. Restaurant, whose name I can never get right. I <laughs> Greens and Vines is a good example of raw vegan cooking or raw vegan <laughs> cuisine. <laughs> You know, I'm going to end it at this point, and I want to end with just this, this, this little last. So the next time you see your doctor, you might try a couple of these, okay? <laughs> doctor, thank you for that advice about increasing my dairy intake, but have you ever heard of the China study? <laughs> or you might try this. Doctor, I noticed you're getting a little big around the middle. Have you tried a plant-based whole foods diet? And lastly, doctor, I heard a great talk at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. You might enjoy seeing your colleague, Dr. Hao, talk about his plant-based diet. And I guess it's on YouTube and it'll show up in about a week or so. So again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. John Hauk, for your wonderfully inspiring personal journey and for your excellent information that you've just given us. I'd like to wish all of you a mahalo for coming and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.